So there. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for laying out the framework. Uh, that definition is very helpful. Everything I talk about in terms of stream restoration is primarily focused on improving the health of the stream, getting it off the 303D list. In other words, going from impaired to unimpaired. So the title of my presentation is Stream Degradation and Restoration with Aquatic Insects as a Guide. And so I'm an aquatic entomologist, stream ecologist, and my data of choice is the aquatic insects. And it's important to keep that in mind as I'm talking. I'm going to describe to you what aquatic insects or aquatic macroinvertebrates are and their use in defining stream impairment or stream, in, uh, stream impairment assessments. What does stream impairment really mean? Many people who work on stream restoration don't really understand what went into labeling it or how little we know when we label it. And then finally, what do we know about stream restoration from the perspective of the, the primary monitoring tool and that is aquatic insects. So the stream macroinvertebrates, aquatic macroinvertebrates, they're primarily aquatic insects, mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, you know, the food of trout. But we also have crayfish, snails, mussels, worms, all of those uh, invertebrates are would be included in our sampling protocol. We focus on the pollution sensitive species, the mayflies, the stoneflies and caddisflies, the EPTs. And that's because they're a very, very important indicator of pollution. They're really our canaries. And every state in the union, every developed country and most of the developing world are using aquatic macroinvertebrates or aquatic insects as their primary stream assessment tool. I'm gonna show you a little bit of data that, that we have out of the Delaware River. This is, represents a whole bunch of studies over the last 20 years. They go from the headwaters uh, of the Delaware up in New York, the drinking water watersheds of New York, all the way down to White Clay Creek in, in the state of Delaware, which is uh, the drinking water uh, watershed for Newark, Delaware, the University of Delaware. And I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of different partners over the years to put the data set together. The first thing I want to illustrate for you is that impairment is a biodiversity question. It's a loss of biodiversity. And we don't often express it that way, but it is a very useful way of expressing it. So on this graph, on the y-axis here, I pl plotted macroinvertebrate score. It's just a simple score that Reese Wochel invented uh, when he was at Virginia Tech. And it goes from zero to 20. 20 is a great stream, zero is a real stinker. On the x-axis, it's the number of pollution sensitive species in a 200 bug count. So at a good stream, I'm gonna have a score say in the 15 to 20 range and I'm gonna have about 20 species. In a fair stream, I'm gonna have dropped down to about 10 species. So a fair category is a 50% loss of the pollution sensitive species. By the time you get down to the poor category, which is generally where you're gonna define impairment, it's going to be around a 90% loss. You're gonna have two or three or four species in, the day, in your sample, 90%. If you think about it from that canary indicator, it means at the good side, all my canaries are happy. But if I'm in this stream and I have 10 canaries and the stream is considered fair, it means five of my 10 canaries are dead. They're not there, I'm not collecting them. By the time it gets to poor, it means nine out of 10 of my canaries are gone. So it's not a minor change. You know, coal miners, for example, one canary drops and they're out of the mine. We wait until we kill nine out of 10 of our canaries before it goes on to 303D list. So keep that in mind. These are not minor changes. If you are ever asked, um, is it really that bad? It doesn't go on the 303D list unless there's significant loss of biodiversity. It's really bad. It's certainly not good. These are those same data just plotted from highest to lowest. So the macroinvertebrate score on the left here from 20 to zero, 20 is great. And you, the thing that this I, I like to show with this is you notice there's no threshold. You're dealing with 300, 400 different species across the Delaware easily. And what we're doing is we're just slowly chipping away the gradual degradation of these communities. 
It's not like a whole bunch are up here and a whole bunch are down here. So when people ask me to describe the Delaware, for example, I say it's fair. About half of the sites are, are good or in the higher end of fair, and about half the sites are in the lower end of fair or poor. In general, I, we find about 20, 25% of the sites would be in, a, in the poor category, and that matches up with, the de with an impairment definition. So Reese Rochelle didn't define poor as impaired, he just defined it as a significant loss of, of biodiversity. But overall, this means across almost 350 sites, over half of the sites I've been uh, fortunate enough to sample have a significant loss uh, of species, 50% or more loss of species. These data for the Delaware match up pretty well with the latest publication. This came out in January, if you haven't seen it, EPA posted the, the National Aquatics Resource Survey. And for our area where the Delaware, um, the agricultural portions of the Delaware and, and um, the Susquehanna would fall into this category, almost 50% of the sites were classified as poor. So that, that in their definition does not support healthy populations of aquatic life. Well, how do we get here? What's been, you know, it, it's a common question. How are we doing? Well, the Clean Water Act, this is the 49th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. And in case you didn't know, that wasn't our first Water Pollution Act. That was an amendment uh, to the 1948 Federal Water Pollution Control Act, which now makes this our 73rd anniversary. The most common question I get is, well, how are we doing? Has the Clean Water Act worked? Well, these are those data I just showed you. And it, that the goal of the Clean Water Act was at a certain time, and there were some deadlines and we've blown right past them. The expectation is all sites would be up here in the good category, more or less, or maybe at least in the middle of the fair category. Well, obviously we have a lot of sites that aren't up here in the good and a whole bunch of sites that aren't in the, in the fair even. So after 48 or 49 years, the Clean Water Act hasn't restored our streams. And that would be my answer it hasn't been completely successful. But if we drill down on sites that we do have some long-term data, and these are some local data um, from the county that the Stroud Center is in, and we were lucky, a partnership between the county and USGS started a monitoring program all the way back to the early 1970s. And having these kind of data are rare, but what it allows you to see is compared to when the Clean Water Act, all three of these streams, and they're right next to each other, all three of them have improved significantly. But we also see for there, there hasn't been a lot of improvement for the last 20 years or so. In other words, somewhere in the mid 90s or so, we started seeing leveling off in our data. And there's not been any real study as to what was going on, but it definitely it shows up in the data when we're lucky enough to have data. So are our regulations and practices protecting the stream? Well, based on the data, we'd say we're still coming up short when it comes to stream and watershed protection and restoration. We probably started down here. All boats have floated up, but we still have a long ways to go before we're up at the blue line. So it's a positive story, but we have more work to do. So then immediately the question is, well, why aren't we seeing more delistings? Why aren't we at least seeing larger improvements in the last 20 years? So here's my assessment. This is what I think is going on it. We haven't had enough time. We haven't had uh, enough intensity. We have done the wrong prescriptions and we've missed things. So let's go through those one at a time, not enough time. This is the timeline for Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where deforestation occurred in the early uh, 1700s and you go through farming, industrialization, the conservation district was started in 1950, and say early stream restoration, say uh, on Lutich Run, gets started in, in the mid-90s. And here we are today at 2000. And what you notice is, is, is the Clean Water Act right here, relative to the timeline that we've been messing around in these watersheds, we've had very little time to try to fix the problems we created. Second, not enough intensity. Again, I go to Lancaster County. The uh, 
it's a nice county to work with very uh, intensively ag it's right on the border between the the uh, Chesapeake and the Delaware so it kind of applies in both directions one thing when we do restoration we do a hundred foot here a thousand feet there I mean those are considered pretty good projects when we only do a project say a thousand feet at a time well Lancaster County has 824 miles of impaired waterways 4.3 million miles or 4.3 million feet of impaired waterways. So if we're doing a project that's a thousand feet long, we have 4,350 projects to do just in Lancaster County at a thousand feet a project. That's for the very worst stream. Remember, we have twice as many, uh, we have another big bunch of streams that are nearly impaired, that are also deserving of intent, uh, attention. So we have a lot to do. It's hard to measure improvement when we're barely scratching the surface. Third thing, wrong prescription. We've spent a lot of time in restoration dealing with sediment load, nitrogen from eroding banks. And um, that was driven by a variety of, of scientific as well as policy arguments. But maybe that was the wrong thing to do. We were down here focused on the channel and rarely were we going up in the field where the challenges that are ongoing here we're talking about for example legacy sediment that might be 200 years old and not addressing the fresh sediment that just goes into the stream on ready every rain event modern pollution it's a challenge when you think about it by working in the channel we're asking we're trying to fix one percent of the watershed and in the process clean up the problems from the other 99 percent and that's really going to be a hard lift. It's probably not possible. The other thing about our being, doing the wrong prescription is we're not learning from our failures. I put up two references here. The first one is Bernhard and Palmer from 2011. It was published in Ecological Applications. So this is 10 years ago, and it's a complete literature review of, of what they could find on the uh, repairing of stream reaches. And you notice the title there, uh, River Restoration, the Fuzzy Logic. And what they found is there was little evidence of ecological uplift. This was 10 years ago. You modify the geomorphic hydrologic uh, attributes and you don't get biological responses. Well, there's a new report out, just came out in December. Some of you might have seen Bob Hildebrand. He was the lead author. I believe he gave a presentation a week or two ago and I missed it, but I, I've heard it's online. He did a wonderful study, 40 different streams, variety of different uh, BMPs implemented, and again came to the same conclusion as they did 10 years ago. Across 40 streams, little evidence of the ecological uplift after the stream's geomorphic attributes had been repaired. Even worse, in some cases, it appears as though the more they do, they actually don't repair things, they make it score worse. So last thing, missing something. I'm gonna focus here not on nitrogen, excess nitrogen, not on excess sediment, but on toxins. We never talk about toxins, but these are working watersheds. And we're, whenever we look now, we're finding pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. These are streams, these are groundwaters, just a variety of different things. Second one up you'd recognize right away is atrazine. Uh, these are the byproducts of farming and, and or urban uh, yard practices and things like that. They show up everywhere now that we're looking. The other thing we're finding is we're finally doing some high frequency data uh, collection and we're finding that most of our data are really underestimating the overall exposure and stress. So this is the this blue line here is the is, is the threshold that EPA limit. The yellow line is what they found when they did high frequency sampling. And the red dots are what they found, in, this is for a drinking water study looking at atrazine, what they found in terms of measurements when they were just doing compliance testing. And all three sites, compliance testing told them that there was nothing going on, but high frequency testing showed, and I'm just using atrazine as a model, how much the agricultural chemicals were working their way through. So peaks and pulses were missed by compliance testing. So our, our perspective on these watersheds 
is, is a bit biased because we don't have the data. The other thing to keep in mind is the toxic load in these agricultural watersheds is, it, is really more of an emerging pollutant. What they did 50 years ago is what, different than what they did 25 years ago, and it's different today. And I'm going to focus here on, two, on three newer um, neonicotinoid insecticides. They were never in use in 2000. You can see, and these are for um, different crops. So corn is yellow and green is soybean. And each one of these has a different change over time. The other thing you notice is nobody's leveled off and the total insecticide load for these insecticides has been greatly increasing such that now when we look in stream water, we find it all over the place, but in much of the year, in other words, there's groundwater contamination. But if you go back to 2000 to 2005, you would have found very little. So our policies and our practices need to adapt to the idea that farming practices are changing. So what do we do? Well, these are my recommendations I often give to the public. We have to do more. We have to try new things. The same effort is gonna give us the same result. And right now we're not seeing good results. The second thing is, is we have to remember that some of what we're doing is research. We're asking a question, will this make a difference? So be careful what you promise because we don't have a lot of evidence that it's a good investment if it's something new. The second thing is, is, as part of that, we have to be vigilant. We have to monitor to assess our success. This is the only industry I've ever seen where thousands, if not millions of dollars are invested. And it's as though we don't care that the roof is still leaking. A house gets inspected and it would be a, a significant failure if the roof leaked or the plumbing had leaked or the, the electricity didn't work. We need to confirm that we got what we were promised and we have to learn either from that positive outcome or from the negative outcome. The last thing I, I bring up, and I'm not gonna address it re really, but you need to be aware of it. In all likelihood, regulations are gonna change. We are either, when you see all the impaired streams that we're looking at, we have two choices. If you're gonna say the regulations are adequate, then we're not enforcing them. If you're gonna say they're inadequate, then we need to revise them. But the bottom line, the demand for clean water and clean streams is only gonna increase. It won't decrease. So what do we do? One of our challenges in general is we measure success by what we see at individual projects. We start with something like this and we end up with something like this. And from that, we project. It's not that we measure it, we assume that we got better stream structure and function. And we assume that we have better nutrients, better sediments, better bacteria, better bacteria or a pesticide retention, degradation, but we don't measure it. And what the data are telling us that we don't we shouldn't trust what we see. It's not what we see, it's what we measure. Remember the quote, little evidence for ecological uplift after the stream's geomorphic attributes have been repaired. We're not seeing delisting of streams. Every, every county in every state in the basin of the Chesapeake would like to delist streams and they're just not getting those results. At the Stroud Center, and I can't take any credit for this, this is really the restoration team at the Stroud Center, and it started even earlier than that with our partnership with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Um, it's a whole farm approach at a watershed scale. There are four steps in it. One is you get the animals and farm practices out of the stream, out of the floodplain, and then you replant that with a forest, with the native forest that was there. Second, you control for pollution from the barnyards, from your manure, manure management infrastructure, from private roads, public roads. Remember that there is a stormwater problem on the farm. The third thing is improve your croplands and your pastures. This is a soil health question. This is a nutrient management question. And it's the vast majority of the landscape we're working in. And finally, you need to aggregate. If you want to improve the watershed and improve the stream, it can't be one farm out of 20. It's going to take all of the farms or 75% of the farms trying to all do the best they can. So what we know based on science is that wide setback fencing helps. We can see it, but we've also measured it, getting the cows out of the stream, 
results in a measurable improvement in the stream. We know that wide forested buffers help moving the farming off the banks of the stream and using the forest both to create in-stream conditions as well as act as a filter improves the stream. We know that if we manage the barnyard well, we get a positive outcome. So we keep this erosion from hitting the stream, the barnyard washing into the stream. What are the functions that we're changing? Here's a list, flow, runoff, erosion, temperature, geomorphology, food resources, nutrient processing, organic matter processing. These are all a net effect. These are not stacked by importance, but rather just alphabetically, so you know. Um, but it's all been done without any channel re-engineering, without any floodplain restoration. This is all be happening because we're breaking the connection between the, what goes on on the land and what reaches the stream. How do we know this? It's been done in terms of science. And I'm gonna show you two studies and then later this afternoon, Lamont Garber is gonna present a third study. First one I'm gonna show you here is work we've done at the Stroud Preserve. Um, this is a working farm. It's been work, a, a farm for 300 years. It's just outside of Westchester. It's actually one of the preserves of, the nat of natural lands. And what we did in 1992 is we installed or, or, or restored, widened the buffer. This is a headwater stream that starts right inside this buffer here. And we installed the level lip spreader. This was the first level lip spreader or conservation swale we'd ever installed. Um, and one of the ideas was to look at what it would do. And then we looked at it for 15 years. In the meantime, the farm continued, the farmer continued to work these fields. What they measured in 15 years, and this is a publication that Google Dennis Newbold, and you can pull it up, they reduced nitrate reaching the stream by 26%. And suspended solids, sediment, was reduced by 43% just by widening the buffer and installing the level of spreader. That's a great example of how we know these things work, but it's very small scale. A lot of my confidence in understanding how you get a, a healthy stream in an agricultural watershed. In other words, how do we have farming and healthy streams coexisting? I use White Clay Creek, the east branch of White Clay Creek at the Stroud Water Research Center as my example. This watershed, just upstream of Avondale, Pennsylvania, has been farmed since the early 1700s. Row crops, hay, pasture, beef, dairy, horses, it's had a fair bit of everything over the centuries. It also had three colonial mill dams and three colonial mills, two sawmills and one grist mill. Um, and I, I pointed them there. So it has a legacy sediment issue tied to old mill dams. Now these were low head diversions down to a mill race. These were not monster dams, but these are very small streams. The Stroud Center is down here. In light green here, I've highlighted the colonial woodlots. Every farm needed woodlots. There's a series of farms up here, and these were the woodlots that they maintained. We're lucky enough to have aerial photographs back to 1937. So we looked at forest cover in 1937, it was 19% for this watershed. In 2016, it's only 33%. So it's increased 14%. And that the increases are these dark colors here, the darker greens, especially down here by the Stroud Center. And these are tree plantings that we've done at the Stroud Center over the last 40 years or so. And you'll notice how almost all of them are at the headwaters or alongside channels where we were restoring the riparian forest in the watershed. And there's some that you can't see up here that are still too young to show up. And this is what it looks like. And again, um, this was, we were learning as we went. This was one of the first buffers that, that I saw go into one of these sections. This went in in 99. This is what it looks like 17 years later. It's not the widest buffer we've ever put in. But it was a big ax when we first started in putting in buffers. You know, it was a tree and one fence to keep the livestock out. Now, 35 feet, 50 feet, we may even ask for 100 feet. There are other things we've done in the watershed. Here's a field here and an aerial photograph from uh, 1993. And you can see an erosion pathway through this field. 
there's a very narrow buffer the stream is over here on the left and this is a farm field here well in the mid 90s we reforested part of that we also added terracing and you can see some of the grooves here are the terracing across the field to help deal with that field erosion we then revisited it in 2016 added level lip spreader here you can see one another one here to deal with anything that made it off the field we would absorb it here and if in fact that level of spreader filled up then level sheep flow through a reforested buffer here and we widen the buffer there in other words we're looking at the watershed and saying where are the problems and what can we do in the meantime we're still maintaining the agricultural productivity of this farm so what's white clay at this point white clay at this point is a cold water fishery White clay at this at white clay is at this point is an exceptional value stream. It got that designation in '84. It's a wild trout stream with only 30 percent, 33 percent of the forest being buffered. And here's one of the big brown trout we pulled out. What I want you to note is this stream recovered without any legacy sediment removal, without any in-stream or floodplain re-engineering. It recovered by getting out of the floodplain, getting out of the stream bed and letting nature heal itself. So the, far, the whole farm approach again is getting out of the floodplain, getting animals and farm practices, replanting the forest, controlling pollution from the barnyards, improving the croplands and, and pastures, especially thinking about your soil health and nutrient management, and then aggregation. And this is what it looks like and gives you an idea of the intensity of work that's necessary from working up in the field, to working in the barnyard, to working with the manure, to working with the animals. You have to look at all of it and deal with all of it. But then when you take those stressors away, you let nature heal itself. So for us, the whole farm approach equals stream restoration and watershed restoration, and they're linked. The stream improves because you have a healthier watershed. So things I'd like you to remember, things that, that I think are important and maybe can help you. One is that the aquatic macroinvertebrates show that many of our streams are still significantly degraded. It's a big loss of biodiversity. There's a lot you can do with just illustrating how bad things are when you're asking to try to improve things. Second thing is, is that our work in these watersheds is a positive story. They have improved a lot in the last 50 years. Our regulations, our requirements, our practices are better than they were 50 or 75 years ago. However, we're not seeing the improvements we would have expected in the last 20 or plus years. And we need to own that. And the only way we're gonna get a better result is not keep doing what we're doing. Because the data are there, it's saying, we're not seeing the improvements. Finally, the, how do we see more improvements? That's gonna be, we need more projects. We need better projects that address the multiple stressors, the multiple pollutants that are coming across the watershed. Fixing one farm out of 50 or one farm out of 20 is not gonna delist a stream. 